Hello, Midnight TCG members. This is Midnight Fox coming to you this week with the Competitive Edge podcast. This week we have Jen co-hosting with me at the beginning of the podcast, and we have Zero Redux guest starring this week working towards the end with me. This week we're going to be going over the evolution of Yu-Gi-Oh! From the inception of the game, the ban list, where it came from, um, to kind of move along some broken decks as time has progressed, and try to get an idea of where Konami might decide to take this game we've all got sucked into in the future. So, <clears throat> with that, start off with a little bit of history of Yu-Gi-Oh! It's been around amazingly. I think we're uh, getting closer to, uh, well, maybe a little bit, bit off to 20 years. We're probably just over 10 years into the game. So, the game's been there for a while. We've had a lot of great sets. It started off pretty basic with normal monsters, spells, and traps. And basically what the game revolved around is who could get out the better monsters. Uh, when it was first brought out, there were different rules like level fives didn't require a tribute. But that's just how the game's rolled along. It's evolved. Uh, kind of went through and seemed like uh, people moved more towards effect monsters. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the start saw the beatdown deck being the major contender for everything because you just couldn't viably make any other deck. There, it was around power monsters. Um, the few effect monsters there were were almost all used. They were essentially the staples of the time. Or, of course, getting the all-powerful Exodia into your hand. He's been around since Legend of Blue Eyes. So, but, of course, when Legend of Blue Eyes came out, you didn't have as much draw power available as there is now. So, still, back then, even with the inception of the game, it was still hard to draw into Exodia. So, a lot of people did go with the beat beatdown instead of going for some of the wins people go for today. Uh, it's all different things. If you ever watch the anime, uh, they also released like Destiny Board, which offered you the ability to win by getting all five letters of final out. And it was a much more viable strategy back then because uh, there was a lot less back row. Um, than there is now, so it was a lot easier to um, clear up all five of your spell trap card zones to get final. I would honestly say where the game started to get really broken, I mean, we could evolve through everything, but where it got really bad was in soul control. I mean, we could go over some of the other things that's been around for quite some time, but I mean, the ban list came when people ran into things like Yada Lock, Time Seal, Dex, uh, just abusage of cards. Mm -hmm. so, I think the it, first broken strategy was the combination of last turn with Jalgen the Spiritualist to create a no-win situation for your opponent. Yeah, it's so, I mean, if people today think, oh, gosh, the game has just gotten so horrible. No, there's always been some magician sitting behind a desk figuring out the best deck strategy to OTK someone. Someone has to think them up first. Then everybody follows the hive mind. <laughs> so it's not just today's game. Of course, now... There are so many more options because we've had so many releases of booster boxes and support given to the game that there are many more options out there. But there's always been, after Legend of Blue Eyes, probably maybe up to, 
I would venture into what spell ruler from about there on, there's always been some way to break the game. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, uh, I believe, um, legacy of darkness is probably where the game made its first major turn. Um, the beatdown strategy became less viable. It, the strategies became more technical. You had uh, your last turn in Jalgen. You had the spirit monsters coming about. Um, with, um, I believe it's, was it Magician's Force that brought, um, brought out Chaos? Um, no, it was Invasion of Chaos that brought it. That was? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, because Chaos Sorcerer and BLS plus Envoy the End came out too, and that's that. Yeah, and you want to know the dark days of this game. Invasion of Chaos is the dark days of the game because those decks were so broken, the game wasn't even fun to play. It was and just that, like right, right there. That is about where, uh, just a little bit before that, I got into the game. I just picked it up and yeah i'd say that's where the meta game began was chaos because um uh, that's when uh, all of the archetypes started to become uh more fleshed more out and you, yeah um because before that there really weren't archetypes uh there were a few that you could say oh well this is an archetype but you're not making a deck out of them like tunes you're not making a tune deck at that time I remember, like, PGD is where we saw Gravekeepers come about for a while. That was quite the annoying deck. Um, and Don Zalug. Yeah, the, the Dark uh, Scorpions. Yeah, the Dark Scorpion decks were pretty big then. I remember back then when the game was still fairly fresh, I would look a little more into fleshing out a strategy no one's seen, but... Pretty much in today's meta, in some ways you have to follow the pack. It's yeah. gotten to that point, but there's just so much out there. There's so much out there, but people aren't willing to stretch their legs to try new stuff. Because it's all now about speed, speed, speed. You know, I remember back in the day sitting back enjoying my games because they would take a while because you'd have to have a strategy behind what you were going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, decks were a lot more flexible back then, too, because um, you could have a, multiple strategies in a deck, whereas now um, you've practiced your strategy. You know you need to get these cards. You need to drop them in this order. Start your combos. <laughs> I'd say... You know, we could go back and forth about all of it, but uh, probably getting to the root of the problem where swarming became a big problem. I'm going to go with saying right around uh, CRB and SOI when we got Treeborn Frog and Cyber Dragon is where the game got really bad for a little bit. Soul control was huge because it was just so easy to let your opponent get out a monster special summon cyber dragon or get a tree born into your graveyard. So, and it was just that special summon being able to pop out a monarch and pop your opponent's spell and trap zone or pop your opponent's monsters with the board. And back then, we still had Dark Magician of Chaos, along yeah. with Monster Reborn. So you could pop your Monster Reborn by getting your Dark Magician of Chaos out, and that created a bit of loop within itself. And I, I, I believe at that time still, we also had Time Sail, which I hated people using that strategy on me. That's where if you've listened to the podcast for a while, uh... That's where my idea of running Wall of Revealing Light, paying 7,000 life points and playing Self-Destruct Button, I got so annoyed that I decided to play that strategy. Wow, I never even thought of that strategy once, and I've been in the game since the first started originally. Oh, it was, it was hilarious. I used to frustrate everybody because 
I didn't run that side deck to win. I side decked three wall of revealing lights and three self-destruct buttons. So within the first few turns, I was sure to pull it. And it was a bur it was a stall deck. So I could stall them out long enough to get that out if they were playing something like Soul Control. Huh. And I would go, Wall of Revealing Light, I'm paying 7,000 life points. Do you Are you responding with anything? No. Okay. Self-destruct button. Draw. That, that is pretty funny, though. It was, it was my little troll deck back in the day, and it was just because as a duelist, I think everybody's come into periods of the game where you just get so tired of seeing nothing but meta and the same deck over and over and over again. If I played yeah, I mean, someone who was playing something that was something of their own creation, I would never side into that. It was when I played the guys who were playing the same deck, basically the same build. I was just like, okay, you know what? Let's just end this. I'm not going to win anyways. We'll just draw out the next two. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can understand that. Like, deck building, it mainly requires a lot of creation. And that's what the game's about, having fun making your own deck. Um, but people have taken it to the point where they just want to win, so they'll take the net deck strategy and just copy someone's deck. And I'm going to... I'm going to blame that on upper deck <laughs> because uh, when Konami first had the game, it wasn't absolutely horribly broken. While upper deck was running it, they really did push for it to be a money game. We didn't see, I'm going to play devil's advocate because I'm a collector. So in a sense, I hate reprints, but the one thing I'll say for Konami is that they are smart in the fact that they do the re-releases and some of them yes some people think they come a little too quickly but they really want to stamp down people making money on the secondary market off their cards yeah Tech didn't care because i believe they they had a section i was part of the judging program back then they actually had a section where you could go onto their site because they had a booklet too. You could go on and buy cards from their site. So of course, they're making money selling singles. They want to drive up the price. So yeah, they're gonna they're gonna make it into a money game. You know, I actually had one of those booklets a long time ago. It's pretty funny though. I always kept those booklets. Uh, when I first started trading, I didn't know anything about the game, so. When I first started trading, I'd say I got ripped off a lot when I looked back at values because I had some fairly decent cards I would get rid of just to build my collection. And then I found the upper deck book and it listed out the values. So I knew if someone was trying to rip me, I'm like, no, here's the price you need to make me a better deal. Yeah, I didn't get into trading when I, until I turned like 15. And I had like a whole lot of real good cards and just I got ripped off plenty of times by them. See, that's the other reason that I kept the book is I wouldn't do that to the little kids. I think uh, when I started going regularly, I was like 22. So I had kids myself. I wouldn't rip off some little kid. I would usually cut them better deals. I'm a little more shrewd now. I'm not going to rip off a little kid on their cards, but I, I'm more shrewd as to what I want to get value-wise when I go somewhere. Yeah, you want to make it fair at least. Usually. I, I a few week, Last month, I actually went to a uh, locals and... A guy told me that he valued his secret Thunder Kings at thirty dollars a piece. Yes. Like, are you nuts? He Those have wanted, been down bad. He wanted my Heraclino secret rare, which is going about sixteen, and two of my vanity beans, which are about fifteen a piece, ultimate rares. And 
Secret Thunder Kings are going for about 15. So, you know, I said, hey, you know, you want my hair if you want two of my Vanity Fiends. How about your three secret rares? He's like, no, I can't take that deal. You'd be ripping me off. I value this at 90, and I only value yours at maybe 25 or 30. I'm like, oh, okay, see you later. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing that's happened with the game so far is that once they made the buy list and everything, people don't usually check back on them to see if their prices went down. And when they do, they try to just keep their cards up at the price it was previously. I mean, that's just not right. I mean, I've, I've done that before too, but I stopped after I realized what I was doing. Well, that's the one thing I'll say for Konami that they have done right. It irritates me as a collector, but as a player, the re-releases and <clears throat> the, speed, the speed that they're coming out, it's so much better for keeping things competitive. I hate it as a collector, but... but as a player, it, they've at least tried to make it more balanced, more fair. That's where Upper Deck was really messing up, and that's where Konami stepped in back in 2009 or 2010, and they said, hey, we're taking the game back over. And they followed that suit, and they won, and they got to take back over Yu-Gi-Oh!, some of us were full of headaches. We got to blame ourselves, though. I know that when Konami took back over, they sent out a email to the up, the current Upper Deck players. Hey, you know, what is really turning you off about the game, basically, was the gist of it. And almost everybody said the price. You know, I remember back in the days where a dad deck went for $1,200. And that is ridiculous right there. I mean, do, do either of you remember back when that, that deck ran for almost $1,200? Um, I actually did look at it a tad bit, and it was pretty expensive back then. And I'm uh, like, this, I make my own deck. So, To me personally, I was like, you know what? I'll go out and buy some boxes and get some extra cards and hope I pull it. I ain't paying $1,200 to run a deck. But then, of course, if you didn't go pay that $1,200... You're going to oh, lose. Yeah, all your competitive players are going to be out there just taking a whack a hole hammer to your head going ding, ding, ding. That are just going to, like, take the Dark Horn Dragon just go, uh, show it right in your face saying you lose. Now, on the other hand of that, though, where, with the reprint, is the real originality of the game. It's it's really went down. I mean, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yes, people are able to go out and, and play the get same the card. Thing. But it's just, it kills off originality. Like, well, I, I just, Chaos what? Dragons, that's the, mo that's the cheapest deck to make. And, and I, right now it's doing pretty good. It even topped, uh, didn't it top YCS Philly? Which one? YCS Philly. No, which which uh, deck? Chaos Dragons. Oh, yes. Chaos Dragons have been running rampant right alongside Wind-Ups, which were the come-from-behind guys, and Dino Rabbit, followed by a very low Insector. Everybody thought Insectors were going to be huge and they were going to be the next big thing, but Wind-Ups... Wind-Ups came right from behind. People did not expect it, and they didn't sign into it, so... I yeah. mean, it's just, yeah. But, uh, I mean, that's kind of the double-edged sword of it. Yes, you can, more people can play the competitive decks, but then that's all you see. Like, people know, I can go out and buy three of the Dragon Collide structure decks and throw in some extra stuff, and I got a deck that's going to win. Yeah, I mean, the most that you got to spend for that deck is 30 bucks, pretty much. Uh, minus the tour guide, for, of course. And so, yeah, 30 bucks and you got the deck. The originality of the game gets killed. But uh, that's where my my hopes, and uh, we went over this in ban list predictions, that uh, I think they're really going to hit Chaos Dragons because it's such a cheap deck to run. <clears throat> They might not hit wind-ups and dino rabbit because they haven't seen a whole lot of play. They might hit it 
in small ways, but I think where they're really going to hit hard is Chaos Dragons because it is so cheap to run. Yeah, I mean, Chaos Dragons, it's cheap to run, and it's broken as hell. Literally just nuts. Yeah, uh, and I mean, when I go to even locals, that's that's what I see mostly. Yeah. And it's it, it, it's quite irritating to go see something like that uh, at locals. I'd expect to see, I, I've said this for a few podcasts, I'd accept, expect to see the same decks at regionals, YCSs, World Championship qualifiers. You expect to see the same decks. But when you go to locals, you go there for variety. Yeah. I, I like to go there to see guys like you who like to play heroes. I've actually seen one player at the locals I'm here at, and I'm currently in Florida right now vacation. And he plays heroes in a different way. He says he doesn't play in the Bubble Beat style, but I've seen it similar to Bubble Beat. But, I mean, it's got its own twists and turns and everything. It used Zephyros and Gores, and it actually beat me pretty good. Me, myself, I tend to switch up decks every month. So what you see me playing one month, I won't be playing the next month. <clears throat> I keep them on Dueling Network because that's where I test them out at. But as far as playing in real life, I'll usually switch out once a month so nobody knows what's coming. Yeah, that gives the edge and surprise into the game. That's actually something that's very good. And honestly, if I was more adept with other decks, then I probably would switch up. But I'm just not. It's it's just like I'm used to here so much I can only play with him. But yeah. um, go ahead. But yeah, back to the issue with the locals. Um, I've actually seen this Chaos Dragon player guy every week. I rarely played him every week, and I lose every week. Well, and we're going to go with Evolution, other than the old engines of old that relied on actual monsters, which back then it was irritating, but it's even worse now. Um, I think the real headache came when they released Synchros, <laughs> which was Konami's baby, Synchros. That was the next evolution from Fusion Monsters. Yeah, because no one really wanted to use Fusion Monsters. They wanted something new, something more original. And the Synchros were just created just for that purpose. And I remember people back in the day on boards and at locals, I'll never use those monsters. They're stupid. They suck. Why would I waste those monsters? But every deck you play today, save for maybe an Exodia deck or a Burn deck that doesn't rely on an extra deck, runs Synchros, or more currently, Xyz. And the one yeah. thing Konami does is they support it. They really push for it. They give you those cards that are going to make their new push work. Xyz are just some of the new rulings that's come out on them like being ranks instead of levels so now and then also where the materials are considered not on the field technically that actually killed off effects like saying and stuff yeah but I, I think the thing that's most annoying to me because every once in a while I like to switch to burn is the fact they're ranks instead of levels to me I see stars that means level that means if I pop out level limit area B, that should switch your Utopia to defense, but it doesn't because it's a rank. Now, that's actually the funny thing because I played a burn deck last week too, and they used that exact same card on me. Um, the only thing was I had my stroke right on the field, so they couldn't do it. Well, and that's that's kind of where, where the game evolves, and... They removed some of the headaches of the game by removing priority, but when they released these monsters and now you're getting into ranks, and it's, just, it's a little bit more confusing and it's hard for new players who are starting the game just to jump in. I have a lot of people asking questions, uh, both on Midnight TCG and over on another forum that I mod on. They uh, a lot of ruling questions about different things like. 
well, how come I can't get this effect from a, uh, for a dark world? Because I ha it says discard a card and, and explain it to them cost versus effect. So, yeah, it, it, it is pretty hard and you do run into some newer players, but that's where we're supposed to be there as duelists to guide these people because these people who are coming in, they're going to be the future. Yeah. If we really want to stay in the game long term, you can't say, oh, you're a newbie. Or you should just quit because you suck. It, it's our responsibility as duelists to help them get better. Yeah, I mean, I've seen people that just take, take another player and guide them under their wing and stuff, and that's actually kind of cool. Um, those players I respect a lot, but people that just cause just like trolls and stuff and make people actually quit the game, that's disgusting. It really is, because, I mean, <laughs> every game has a shelf life. And people certainly didn't think Yu-Gi-Oh! would be around as long as it has. Magic has transcended for quite some, quite some time, and people thought that game would die out. Has it become less, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, less visible? Yeah. Yes, yes and no. To the dedicated mages who play the game, they know where to go. They yeah. know where to go if they want to find something online. They know where to go if they want to play. And I've actually seen people switching now from Yu-Gi-Oh! to Magic. So, but Wizards offers a lot more as far as uh, money compensation, but Magic is more of a money game too, so. Yeah. It's and not, then actually the uh, the new Card Fight Vanguard game is also a money game too because you have to spend at least two hundred to make a deck, and that's just for like I think six of the main fifty units you need in the deck. Yes, but it's not as horrible as <coughs> I mean. <clears throat> Your stuff that wins consecutively in Yu-Gi-Oh, like wind up, is probably going to run you anywhere from three fifty to six hundred dollars if you want the best engine available. Yeah. Unless you just get lucky and you find someone who's wanting to get out of the game and they're willing to sell their stuff. Either that or you pull out everything you need and pack, which that takes an incredible amount of luck. Which leads me into my next topic, uh, the evolution of the game. Uh, going back to the upper deck thing, it's kind of like reading your Wall Street Journal. You could tell from month to month where something was going. Yeah. But now that Konami's taken it over, <laughs> and with ban list being right around the corner, it's like playing the stock market. You see a lot of places slow down on their trades buying selling because you don't know if you're going to go out and waste three hundred dollars because something's going to get banned or you don't know if you want to go out and waste eighty to a hundred dollars buying a card because you don't know if it's going to be reprinted so yeah it, i think the scribe dragon is actually going to reprint the new 10 which i think people will probably try to use a lot more i like scrap dragon but i i personally prefer thought ruler over Scrap Dragon. Uh, he is a good That's beat why stick. I catch mine. He is a good beat stick, but honestly, in today's meta, you really need to be running a Solemn Judgment and two Solemn Warnings to keep up with most decks. I side deck my warnings, but I have Thought Ruler there for when I'm running it because the one thing people don't think about when they put these cards in their deck, and this is where you guide people, Every solemn warning is going to cost you 2,000 life points, and solemn judgment is going to cost, cost you half. A half. So you're going to end up with dead cards in your hand if you don't have enough life points to pay for it. That's why yeah. I like Thought Roller, because he's a good tech card for gaining back life points to make sure that one of those three cards is not going to be dead if you draw it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if my deck can at least run a Thought Roller Arc Fan, I would have probably used it in a heartbeat because it just it brings back so many life points. Um, 
I actually, in order to conserve my life points, I actually cited out my um, Solemn Judgment for just cards like Call of the Haunted and stuff. So kind of to end this out, uh, where do we see the meta going next format? We do know we have Return of the Duelist hitting at the end of the month, and we can look forward to the Water Structure deck along with Abyss Rising later on this year. Where do you see well, it? Going? I think actually Abyss Rising here, uh, the Neos Fusions are going to be coming back because of the Miracle Contact spell that's supposed to be in it. What do you think of the Noble Knights there pushing like the Knights of the Round Table? That's actually kind of odd theme, and I've, uh, I'm have i thinking of actually trying that soon. The Maladosh Archetypes is coming out too, and I have a prediction that's going to be coming as a top tier deck at least. I think it's between... I'm going to say it's between three of them. Madolchi, um, the Spellbook, and the uh, prophecy, yeah. the way those two coincide, and the mermails. A lot of people I see are testing the mermail archetype on Dueling Network. And then there's supposed to be another archetype called the Thunder archetype, where it's got Fa Thunder, Ma Thunder, Sis Thunder, and um, I think Bro Thunder. I don't know. We could see Battery Men make a comeback. Eh, I'm predicting that at least. <laughs> I used to love Battery Man decks. I actually tried to experiment a Battery Man what deck, and it worked for the shortest amount of time. But I just I couldn't I couldn't deal with today's meta game or anything with it. And that's exactly it. Is today it's all about swarming and speed, and I mean the only way to really stop it is to run anti-meta things like. Thunder King, Vanity Fiend, Warnings, but Konami's steadily releasing stuff to even get around that to where they're not as much of a problem. Yeah, as of right now, it's either you go all out, just push as much as you can, or get pushed back. It's basically like it's basically like you're on top of a giant cliff with a base falling down. Whoever makes the wrong move is going to get pushed off. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I see it. I see uh, the next format kind of – I see it going, actually, with the best rising in the water structure deck and what's already there. I see maybe some kind of water-based card, uh, Tribe Infecting. If Tribe Infecting comes back, then my heroes are screwed because all they got to do is just call one type <laughs> and boom. And that's exactly it, and part of me thinks that's what Konami's doing where they're supporting these archetypes like Insectors or all Insects and Dino Rabbit is pretty much dinosaurs except for the Rabbit and a few extra cards, and the Madolchis, I believe, are all Spellcasters. And here uh, are... No, they're, they're different archetypes. It's just they got the same ability to go back into the deck. Um, I think one spellcaster, the other being warrior, uh, beast, and stuff like that. I I've looked at the deck. It just I forgot what all the types are. It's been a while since I played against it. I I haven't personally built it yet, but when I saw it played against me, I was like, well, "Do huh?" So yeah. I'm watching for it, but. I don't put a lot into the decks until I actually see the cards hit over here. Yeah. But Tribe Infecting, I, I did a review tonight over Sinister Sinister Serpent. I really don't see that coming back. For anybody... It comes back, it's going to get real bad. Um, that's I actually hope for Witch of the Black Horse, because it did get a reprint in our battle pack. Even though it's a banned card, I still hope it comes back. But Demok and I believe didn't Chaos Emperor no Chaos Emperor didn't get reprinted in that, but Demok did too. Yeah. So there's hope for both of those. But there were some uh There were other cards that are just ridiculous to be reprinted. Raigeki, uh Cyberjar, I 
I'm a little bit mixed on that because I never really had to face an empty jar deck. I think it would be good to see Cyber Jar come off of there because... I mean, it destroys all card. monsters. It's a chance card. It doesn't set up for an engine to get a Cyber Jar out there because you don't know without stacking your deck what your cards are going to be that you're going to pop out on the field. That or with the... Um... With the pigeon holding books to spell, you won't know what your opponent's cards are going to be, and you won't know yours either until you actually done it. So, I mean, we've got less than a month now. Everybody's counting down the days to the next ban list. We've got. Yeah, I'm just trying to play as much as I can, get in as much as I can with my heroes, because I have a feeling that they're going to get hit a little bit, even though they haven't lost anything. I think the worst thing that's going to hit hit heroes, and it's not even huge to heroes as much now, is going to be future fusion, and that's mainly just because they uh, are going to hit future fusion for chaos dragon. We know it's going to happen. That deck is so broken. In heretics, there's more support coming out for them. So either way, chaos dragons are heretics. It's easy to just pop into a future fusion, and good game. Well, yeah, that's true. But I'm yeah. also expecting to see the uh, Darkness Metal get hit. Um, Life Pulse, I know, should probably get hit as well, because if it doesn't, then it's going to be all for nothing. Well, we'll see. Uh, he mainly... I, I don't see why I really don't see wind ups or Dino Rabbit getting hit as hard as everybody thinks it will. I think Chaos Dragon is kind of like they looked at the plant engine and they tried to pick apart what were the worst parts of it. Yeah. Like <laughs> I think the only thing I'm expecting to see out of wind ups is actually rats, because rats Rat actually induces the summonings a lot more from the graveyard. And if you don't have the rat, then you can't go off of the loop. And I mean, Wind Ups and Mighty at least lets you pull Rat out. So even if he's not in your starting hand, then there's no real issue. And me and me and uh, All City had a conversation back and forth about that a few podcasts ago. Uh, I, I look at them to hit Hunter, too. Between those two, out of wind-ups, I see that being the two target cards they're going to hit. I see yeah. maybe a semi-limit or a limit to Rabbit. But yeah. I re there, there's not enough support in Dinos as far as big beat sticks like Alexandrite Dragon is 2,000 for Dragons. There's not enough support for Dinos. Your best one is Saber Source at nineteen hundred vanilla. I thought it was Cobas yeah, Saber Source is nineteen hundred, Cobasaurus is eighteen, I think. Seventeen. Oh wow. yeah. That's that's the worst of it, so I, I don't yeah. see them hitting that. And it's still a fairly expensive deck to build because they haven't re released Rescue Rabbit. Yeah, but, they were thinking that was actually gonna come out in the tens, but that that killed their dreams. Well, we don't know about the second wave of tens yet, but we do yeah, know. Uh, there's That's... actually a special tin coming out. And it's getting its own set. It's called Prophecy Destroyer. Um, we don't know the exact effect yet, but I think it goes with the prophecy exactly. It goes with the spell books. Yeah. Because I think it, I think part of the effect is it just showed that like it can only be Summoned by banishing three spell books from the grave, I think. Yeah, I actually had it, but it's not up on my uh, computer right now, or I'd go over the effect. Uh, I believe we do have it linked on the site, though, so definitely go over there, take a look, follow the link, and you can find out about Prophecy Destroyer. Yeah. But I would like to see Tribe Infecting. The way they've been pushing Archetypes, I really could see that being a possibility. And then another card that could probably work, too, is a Trop, Sh uh, Trop, Sh 
tribe shocking virus. I don't know what's up for me today. Um, it can actually be pretty viable in it because instead of destroying cards, it banishes them. So, tribe shocking is okay, but I don't think it hit as hard as tribe infecting. But uh, yeah. that uh, just about does our time for the night. Uh, just want to push again, people. Flash tournament. Everybody missed tonight. You never know. I uh, might decide to redo the theme for this week since we had Eddie Phoenix win the tournament by default this week. I'm thinking of possibly changing it to a Tuesday or Thursday. So go weigh your thoughts in in the Flash tournament thread. So if that day works better for some of you, let me know. and. We could see about switching days on it. Uh, just did the YouTube announcements. So I'm not going to plug a whole lot of things tonight. Just the things we went over over the last day or so. I just did YouTube announcements. So if you want to hear what's going on on the site, go check out August 2012's announcements. A little quick five-minute segment that kind of gives you an overview of some of the things that's going on. But it's been real. It's been awesome to have you on the podcast with us tonight, Hero Redux. And no problem. I'm glad to be here. And all you members at Midnight TCG, have a good night.